This segment is brought to you by GoToAssist. Ow! It hurt me. There's no battery in there? Holy s***. So what got you in ham radio? Uh, let's see, uh, what got me in ham radio? So, um, uh, be when I left uh, Intel, um, I uh, was a uh, uh, consultant for oh, about a year and a half working for a private company in Seattle. And one of our um, one of our clients was the State of Washington Emergency Management Services Division, and um, I was actually doing some exchange work for them. They were they needed some uh, some clustering, some exchange server clustering, and so they brought us in. This is yeah, two thousand. I remember I used to be an exchange admin. Oh, there you go. So there... you know all about the MTA stacks and all the fun. Apps. I wasn't a total expert because I was kind of a jack of all trades. You know, I could build the exchange servers, do the mailboxes, do the stores, all that. But I, my focus was mostly on like server, hardware, OS, networking. Um, so you know, I've done SQL, done a little bit of everything, just because as a consultant you have to. Yeah. Um, so anyway, they brought us in to. Um, Build a couple of servers, um, optimize their data center. You know, like um, clear out. You know, like boxes in front of the uh, the chiller so there'd be venting. I mean, there was just they, their whole thing was a mess. But we came in and um, put together a couple of exchange servers, uh, ran some fiber to the to the to the switch and the routers and stuff. And uh, one of the folks there, he was uh, one of their radio people, and he was their senior technician for the state. And he goes, hey, you want to see something really cool? I said, sure. So he brought me into a radio room. It was all these you know, amateur radios in there. And I had never worked with um, amateur radios. I'd worked on um, radios in the military. They, they're on the aircraft. And so I worked with, I knew a little bit about VHF and HF radio. And he goes, I'm gonna show, let me show you how to send a text message uh, and email via ham radio. And so he uh, sat down at this at this console. It was a PC, and pull up the airmail client and uh, turn on the radio, turn on the TNC, and quick made a quick uh, message, and then um, went to the other side of the room, turn on the other radio, turn on, on the other TNC, and totally broadcast uh, a, a, an email. And I was like, wow. So that, that was first, impressed. Your first introduction to ham radio was actually packet radio. It was yes in two thousand. Six, as a matter of fact, um, so in two, it was around November, December 2006 when I first in, was introduced to packet radio, AX25 networking protocol, um, all these things I had never never worked on. Um, so I'd called around to find out where I could take my um, amateur radio test, and I called um, called a. Uh, uh, group in Kent, and they said, "Oh, if you want a really, really good uh, training program, call Microsoft because they have microhams. And microhams, they teach people how to do ham radio, packet radio, and you can take your test." Hmm. So I was like, "Cool!" So I contacted them, signed up for their class, and I knocked out my technician and general um, class radio within two months. Got it all done. And so then I contacted the folks back at EMD, who I had quit that company. Uh, who I worked for before, work, went back to the state, and I said, hey, I'm going to be back in packet radio. So they said, great, we need volunteers. So um, I still volunteer at the state of Washington in the emergency management division, and uh, we, we do HF and VHF packet radio, and we use uh, WinLink. We use a client called AirMail, and um, we, uh, we communicate uh, through other ham radio operators and through other agencies actually using packet radio. So, I mean, in a sense, we're all kind of familiar with packet radio because the ubiquity of Wi-Fi, but how does, you know, packet radio differ from that kind of like unlicensed stuff that we use on the 2.4 or the 5.8 gigahertz spectrum with our little, you know, blue consumer Wi-Fi routers and whatnot? Sure, and that's a great question, Darren. Darren. Um, so, um, as we know that our Wi-Fi, we're, we have strict frequencies that we broadcast on. We have different channels, right? But there's within a narrow, you know, spectrum. 
Um, and it's and it's usually short range. You know, we can set up ad hoc networks or whatnot, and they go you know certain feet, maybe up to a few hundred feet. When you start working with packet radio and with uh, VHF, HF uh, frequencies, you can broadcast much longer distances. So, so give me an example. I mean, I know that I could, I could potentially do five miles with two parabolic antennas on Wi-Fi, yeah. 5.8 gigahertz point to point. Yeah. But that's a very specific use case and kind of hard to dial in. It's not like you know, put up an omnidirectional antenna and, and broadcast to the world that way. It's, it's uh, so absolutely. So, how is the ham radio different, and what what kind of ranges do you expect? And in best case scenario, let's just imagine we're like in the middle of the ocean. Okay, uh, great great question. Um, so it's the same principles. Um, it's just that with ham radio, we have access to satellites, so we can bounce signals off satellites. Yeah, just. Willy nilly, you just pick a satellite and bounce it. <laughs> uh, no, no, there, there, there are some public uh, and, and SEC funded um, public uh, satellites that we can use, and uh, you have to know the frequencies and obviously be a licensed radio operator and that kind of thing. But there are a couple of satellites that we can use. Um, we also, when we broadcast, like say from what they call uh, shore to ship or whatnot, we use HF radio, and so uh, HF radio you can broadcast for hundreds of miles. Just skipping across the surface of the earth between cloud and to the ship so hf radio uh, using pactor for um for long distance communication packet radio and vhf for local or regional um communications but we have access like i said to satellites heck we can even do moon bounce if it's really far we can broadcast a signal from your station to the moon and then to the receiving station if you know what frequency they're on Sure there's a lot of math involved in that, uh, hopefully on some online calculators to, to help figure that all out, dial it in. Um, so to get kind of like an idea of, you know, the spectrum between like three kilohertz and 300 gigahertz, you know, the, the fun stuff that us hackers have been, you know, toying with is that ISM band, that in, industrial, scientific and medical, that, you know, 700, or sorry, 900 megahertz, the 2.4 gigahertz, the 5.8 gigahertz. That's where we're really having fun in the unlicensed stuff. You mentioned... VHF, UHF, and HF. Where are the where do those fall in the spectrum? Okay, yeah, like you mentioned, like for example, nine nine hundred megahertz. Very, that's like bread and butter, right? A very very common. Um, whereas we can talk, we can broadcast on HF like and whatnot, like the fifty two, or we can fifty two what fifty two megahertz. megahertz. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or uh, into uh, like for example, uh, CB radios mm -hmm. broadcast on the AM spectrum. Okay. Uh, very low wattage. Um, and that's like what, 170 megahertz? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got the um, uh, VHF band, which you know is like you know 144 up to the cops and the firemen use like 555. So there's a whole rod spectrum of where we can broadcast. Depends on what you want to do. For example, um, HF is good for long distance, but it's but it, the, the transmission rate drops because you're going a longer distance. Whereas if you're shorter distance using UHF, VHF, you can do a much faster transfer rate, but shorter distance. So it's a, it's a give and take. So, so is it safe to say that generally speaking, the trade-off is that the higher the frequency you're using, the more data you can transmit, but the shorter distance it'll be, whereas the lower the frequency, you can go further, but it'll be much uh, slower data rate. Absolutely, yeah, that, that's that's correct. When the um, for HF, like for example, when you transmit a, a packet on using HF, say I'm my friend is who's on a sailboat, he's an uh, he's got an HF radio, he's off from the coast of New Zealand now. Um, for me to transmit a packet uh, to him, we're talking 300 baud, very slow. And so to our, to our viewers that don't remember modems and baud rates, 300 baud is ass slow. Um, I remember, you know, on, on the bulletin board systems, eight, you know, 8K uh, or 8-bit eight, eight ASCII painting an entire 80 character by 25 character screen at 300 baud. That'll take a minute. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, whereas, we're, if we're locally, like say uh, we're just a few miles away, or even 30 miles away, you know, I can broadcast on uh, VHF. I can broadcast at 1,200 baud, right? And um, some some of them can go up to 9,600. So, okay, 9,600 baud is the very bare minimum you need to do a multiplayer game of Doom 2. So. To put that into perspective, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Depends on the distance, of course. Shorter the distance, much better a response you've got. Um, but one thing also too is uh, we can also send attachments 
uh, in our email too. So if you want to send a PDF, depend, obviously it's going to take longer, the bigger the, the packet is because it has to be broken up in chunks and sent. Um, but uh, we are using the AX25 protocol, which has been around for a million years based on the um, X25 protocol. Um, and it's reliable. It's, um, it, it's got... It, and so that's a signaling protocol. It's a signaling a networking protocol, absolutely. Um, it was used a lot in Europe you know, a long time ago um, till I, IP came about. Um, so X25 is kind of like, you know, you got, if you're familiar with TCP IP, and then there was that Novell stuff that was around in the 90s, and thank God we don't have to deal with it anymore. Network, it was IPX. Network, I, yeah, IPX, IPX, SPX, yeah. Absolutely. And so uh, X25 is kind of like in that. It's kind of below that, below um, that. because this is it's a non-routing protocol, Okay. right? And So it's, in, it's insecure by design, though. Yes, it is. It is insecure by design, uh, but it's reliable, um, and it's simple. And for uh, the, basically when they say AX25, it's just been modified um, it's been slimmed down even a little bit more for ham radio. Yeah, and I know that on like for instance Debian, if you're running or like Ubuntu or something, um, it's very easy to like. There's kernel modules where you can actually just install it, and then it shows up as AX and then zero for your first interface. And so you basically end up with like a network card that is AX25, and then whatever you transmit through that goes to your TNT. We'll get to that, but that so so it's a protocol that's pretty ubiquitous. It's time tested, but insecure. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> uh, lightweight, reliable, um, been modified, tweaked for for ham radio, um, amateur radio. Um, but uh, yeah, it is insecure, so you'd have to take care of you know security at the client. You know, if you're to do something like that. And so, what is what does this allow you to do? What do, what do you mainly use uh, amateur packet radio for? Um, well, good example is uh, like. Um, in a disaster situation or, um, uh, for example, at the state of Washington, we have lots of different radios, you know, for disaster or for a national emergency or whatever. Um, satellite communications, you know, Wi-Fi, we've got WiMAX, we got all these different things. Satellite, um, you know, those can be knocked down. We could have an electromagnetic pulse. A lot of things could be destroyed. But when it comes um, at the end of the day, if things were to become destroyed or, or disrupted, ham radio, it, it's point to point, and you can build up build out mesh networks with other amateur radio operators. Um, it's kind of like the last line of defense. And so, during exercises when the military or when the emergency management services run their exercise, um, they integrate us uh, as kind of like the, uh, the the last scenario. So if things were to fail, um, there's always ham radio. Is what they say. When things fail. There's always ham radio. And uh, I mean, I guess the, so how, do you, how do you even get started? Uh, I know that with ham radio, there's kind of like two aspects of it. You need one, the education and the license, and then you also need like hardware. So maybe you could walk me through, like if you wanted to get started today, you wouldn't just go on eBay or Amazon or wherever and purchase a bunch of equipment, would you? Or how, how would you even get started? Great questions. Um, well, um, uh, there are uh, uh, online stores. Uh, some of the bigger stores, like for example, one I order from is called Ham Radio Outlet. It's right. kind. Of, it's kind of. It's in yep. Uh, there's there's one there. There's one back east. There's one in Portland, Oregon, and uh, so they're kind of the the superstore for amateur radio operators. They've got TNCs, radios, cables, everything. Um, to get started, as far as training goes, um, there's not a lot of formal classes like when you said. In IT, it is challenging enough when your team is all working in the same office, let alone when you're supporting members remotely. And that's why you need GoToAssist by Citrix. You can take control of your entire IT world from one simple cloud-based platform. With GoToAssist, you can keep all of your systems up and running while providing your users support, provide live or even unattended support from anywhere, even your iPad. And with GoToAssist monitoring, you get customizable dashboards displaying performance of all of your networks, your servers, your desktops, plus get this proactive alerting that allows you to fix all those small issues before they turn into big problems, making you an IT hero. Now, I worked as a sysadmin for 10 years in the DC Beltway area, and for about 90% of the time, I was telecommuting from Williamsburg. And let me tell you, GoToAssist has saved my bacon on more than one occasion. It took just minutes to set up, and I remember right after the first session, completely ditching that finicky solution I had before. It just does the thing and gets out of the way so I can focus on doing my thing. 
Now check it out, you're gonna love it. You can sign up for their special 30 day free trial today. Just head over to gotoassist.com and click on the try it free button and then they use the promo code HAK5. That's gotoassist.com with promo code HAK5. To get started as far as training goes, um, there's not a lot of formal classes like when you sign up for college, um, but there's a lot of radio clubs. Um, so a lot of amateur radio clubs are normally, there's at least a few and a couple in each city. Um, there are online resources now They're for taking the exams. You can study for, there's ex exam generators to take online and there's volunteers that um, uh, basically proctor the exam for you. The exam's not very much. It's about twenty dollars, probably eight, nine hours worth of study. You take the exam, you can become licensed. Uh, and so what is that first test? What does that first exam give you a license to do? You said that there were general, you said there was technician, you said there was expert. What are those different levels and what do they mean as far as what you can do with them? Yeah, it, basically it, it kind of unlocks different um, levels as it were. You, you like level up, you gain some experience. Absolutely, that's basically what the, what the concept is. Technician level is the first one. The, um, technician allows you to do uh, UHF, VHF broadcasts. Um, you, can, you can, what they say, operate a station by yourself. You've been licensed by the SEC, you know, the rules and the regulations. Um, when you get into uh, general class, which is the one above that, um, that unlocks uh, more uh, frequencies, including HF which is long distance global communication. And when you get into expert, and there's only, out of all the um, radio operators that are expert level, there's only, oh, they're like 10% of the total. And they get in some advanced stuff, more electronics, uh, working with radar, um, some really sophisticated um, These stuff. are the folks that work at NASA. Work at NASA, or they have a really burning desire to, to understand things like microwave transmission, ra uh, radar, and it locks a couple of more higher level um, uh, HF frequencies. But yeah, there's a lot of math involved in that one and there's a lot of uh, study. I studied on it uh, a couple of years ago, scoring around 50% and then got too busy, life happened and didn't pick it up. But basically, um, to get started, to do all those kind of things, the technician class is, is more than adequate to get you started. And then when you want to get to more advanced things with you know HF and, and packet, then that's when you want to go for general. And do you just go to FCC.gov, give me your credit card number and take the test online? Or do you have to go to a facility? How's that work? Yeah, so what you do, um, you normally um, uh, Google online, find out the nearest uh, ham radio club in your city. Say, I'm so-and-so, I'm interested in taking the test. What resources are available? And can you guys proctor the exam? And they'll say, uh, oh yeah, we have our testing sessions on the first Tuesday of the month. And, da, 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 and then we, and we test out on Saturday, you know, the, the, the second Saturday of the month. They usually have a schedule. Um, there's books that you can order online, Amazon books. Um, there's a couple of good study guides. And uh, QRZ.com is the, uh, the super geek website for the free online test generators. So you can, you can actually take the online exact practice exams for free. So there's a couple of those as well. That's interesting. I didn't realize that it's actually the amateurs that are testing the potential amateurs within the radio club. <laughs>